Kazi Khalid Ashraf and uh, Nicholas Graber are going to have a conversation <coughs> together. Let's uh, start the conversation with uh, Professor Kazi Khalid Ashraf and Nicholas Graber. Nicholas? Good evening, Kazi. Good evening. <laughs> this is a new format. Uh, we have done conversations before. We don't have a set plan. And we thought that maybe we will not do it like this, that uh, Nicholas presents and I present and then we have a conversation. I think we'll just jump into the conversation and when he or I feel like, we'll do a presentation. Uh, so we see this is an experiment. Okay, it's yeah. a performance. Okay. okay, good evening to everybody. Um, Maybe I have to explain a little bit on the background. Please I'm do. I'm here tonight. Yes. A uh, little so bit. Who are you? A <laughs> little bit of the history. Yes. Um, <coughs> and uh, how I met you. How I ended up um, in the realm of Bengal mm -hmm. Institute. Um, uh, yeah, while you do that, I'll pull up an image. Okay. Well, meanwhile, I start right. with this one Please. over here. Um, Kazi, pick the title: Streams and Waves architecture in Bangladesh um, and we will maybe talk about these streams, okay. waves right. yes. later on. <coughs> but one thing what um, was always obvious to me seeing architecture in Bangladesh was that kind of a continuity which is presented here in, in kind of a history, uh, assemblage of different types from different epochs. Uh, and um, basically, it is, it is a, a, a journey through a history of some hundred years that made appear contemporary architecture today and that draw my interest. So, talking about Bengal Stream, I have to say this is a journey that started back in 2012 when I first visited Bangladesh and I very much hope that this journey will go on and on and on like a big um, stream. Um, the reason I came to Bangladesh in 2012 was like for many other architects in the West to visit uh, the famous building by Louis Kahn. Or this man about whom I'm going to talk about in yes. a second. Yes, see, perfect. That's you. you. 1987? Yes. Uh, <laughs> yes. Good. Leave it as a mystery. I think it looks alike. <laughs> Do you know him? No. Okay. So, you can now tell about to... him? Wait. Right now? No, a little later. Okay, anyway, I came here uh, to visit <coughs> the parliament, and um, but I found much more. <coughs> uh, I found endless streams and rivers, not only in the landscape, but also in terms of architecture. Because um, I happened to meet architects here the very day I went to the parliament. In the evening there was a reunion uh, at Mangalbara Shoba, and that's where I got aware that um, in Bangladesh there's a very vibrant architectural scene from which I haven't heard a lot uh, before. Of course I had read some texts, most of them from Kazi, because he was the only one basically writing internationally about uh, Bangladesh at that time. But I didn't find a lot of um, information about the contemporary architecture, uh, not on internet, not in books, and I started to do a little uh, research on that, traveling through the country, meeting the architects, um, and ending up uh, at the Bengal Institute. That's maybe a little bit of an introduction before we go into the subject. And now I'm curious to hear about... Curious about this man. Okay, so Nicholas uh, came to Bangladesh in 2012, the first time, right? And then since then he has come to Bangladesh a number of times, uh, made friends, met people, and he has traveled all across the country. I think he has traversed more miles than I have in the country, so... Um, that's why this man is up here. Um, so instead of directly uh, introducing Nicholas with his dedication, with his relentless pursuit to, um, first of all, document, understand, and then represent the contemporary architecture of Bangladesh, and he has done, uh, you will see about the exhibition in a bit. I think that's a marvelous exhibition and a fantastic uh, book 
And I think both the exhibition and the book will remain as landmarks in terms of the journey of modern architecture in Bangladesh. So for that, congratulations, Nicholas. The book makes you realize in a much more um, immediate way, perhaps we had been thinking about this in one way or another, that has the architecture of Bangladesh arrived somewhere, which is now need to be noticed. I mean, not that it wasn't noticed before and not, not that it wasn't written about before, internationally speaking, uh, but it was a random, not all put together in a way that you could like really understand it in a comprehensive way and figure out the various strands and the fabrics, which the book does very well. But I think this is something that you might, you might have to respond to, that has the architecture of Bangladesh arrived somewhere, despite everything, despite desperate Dhaka, or despite other things that you hear about the country. Um, and then, and more than any other arts, that has, uh, architecture has uh, reached an international platform, an audience, and, in, and an interest, and why that is so. Uh, in some sense, well, Nicholas is from Switzerland, you know, in terms of the, ex the geographical extent of the two countries, they are similar, not quite with population and, and other, other things. So I think uh, the architecture of a country being known far and beyond is not really related to either size of the country or the density or anything. So there must be something else which we can explore a little bit. The other thing that I thought uh, we might discuss, uh, I, I have mentioned this in Basel during the opening that I love the title, Bengal Stream. I think you uh, considered various things, perhaps Bengal School at, at some point, and you did not, and I think uh, stream is better than a school. School seems regimented, disciplined, and, um, well, frozen in a sense. Stream flows. And as I said before, that it might have counterflow or overflow, but I think I like this liquid metaphor. But stream also means that, as you said, there's a continuity. And I think for uh, some of our younger friends here, uh, I don't know how much you are aware of what makes up the upstream of the stream. Uh, there may be sporadic publications, and I fear that not all of the publications and the writings and the activities that has happened before Bengal Stream are fully registered in our, uh, in our imagination. So I think that's something to talk about today and perhaps that's the task in any case we have to take up. Which is to say Bengal Stream is part of a uh, flow that has started somewhere. And tonight we would, we would like to kind of uh, discuss that. Where does the stream start? At the foothills of the Ganges, right? Yes. So, uh, and then stream or wave, wave right? You know, there's the two difference. Uh, a wave, as the name suggests, uh, you know, it can come in phases, big waves, small waves, and it peters away. So I think stream is a good title, perhaps. Um, so that's uh, one thing. Uh, the other thing is that I th they, what the exhibition does, and th that Nicholas has to answer, uh, why this body of work, and why not other things? And there may be questions about that. Uh, what led you to gather, assemble this cluster of work, uh, which then becomes a representative of Bangladesh, or which Bangladesh should be something. Because the architecture of Bangladesh now is very diverse, rich, um, many strands of operations, and that's all very fantastic. And I think, again, for the, uh, the younger architects here, uh, some of that is, uh, I think, and they're quite aware of that, but I think we might have to discuss that. What is this diversity in the architecture of Bangladesh? But back to this photograph. Uh, I don't know if anybody has seen this photograph or you know this man, David McCutcheon. He was in Bengal, West Bengal. He was an Englishman. He, he died in the 70s, I believe. He, was a, he, has a, he had a background in literature, and I think he studied in Cambridge University. He got very interested in Bengal, and uh, he was invited to come and teach at Shanti Nikatan. And it seems there's a whole uh, sort of uh, flow of people coming from Europe to Shanti Nikatan, you know, the <coughs> Rabindranath Tagore's university, Bishop Harati. So he came to teach literature. 
And then in the 50s, he befriended the filmmaker Satyajit Ray. And Satyajit Ray asked him to translate some of the dialogues for the subtitles in English. So that's what he did. He also had a writer's workshop in Calcutta at that time, <coughs> people writing in English. And uh, some of the books that came out of that writer's workshop, they're quite fairly well known. <coughs> a lot of respect in West Bengal, at least, for David McCutcheon. He was known as David Dada. Dada, you know, it's like Big Brother. Uh, so while on, so uh, Satyajit Ray would take him to various sort of shooting locations while filming. And once they went to Birbhum, that area, and David McCutcheon encountered these brick temples. And that led to an obsession for the rest of his life. He died very young, early 40s. But since uh, 1950s to 70s, he traveled all across West Bengal and Bangladesh on a bike, recording the brick temples of Bengal and Bangladesh. He had some 20,000 images, which were then gifted to the Victoria and Albert Museum, and they had a show and all that. But then it came out as a book uh, this is one of his photographs, and this temple is in Bangladesh. Uh, th so that's the book, Brick Temples of Bengal. So it's a massive catalog. This is a, sort of a, uh, it's a big heavy book, fat book, edited by George Michel, if someone, uh, some of you know, he's a well-known architectural historian. But I see this as an example of that. Okay, it doesn't matter where one is from. So the dedication of David McCutcheon and doing this documentation, I found it. Uh, I thought today I would mention this. I think this, this leads to the point of the stream again, or to the wave. <clears throat> as I mentioned before, the stream as a continuous thing, coming from a source very, very far away, back in, well, thousands of years back, maybe. And still today, I think the stream, the source of that stream, still here um, in contemporary architecture. That's something that struck me um, seeing the buildings, uh, building production of today, that there is a lot of references to these old monuments, conscious or unconscious. But um, that stream was never cut, even not through the English. Um, they never really could stop that Bengal stream, I would say. And that continuity was uh, brought, of course, to modernity by Masrul Islam later okay. on. Um, and this is something unusual, I think, that you find a, a radically modern architecture uh, language in a country which still remains rooted to the um, past. And that stream today, as you mentioned, has many different branches. That's uh, something I find very interesting. Um, that's why yeah. I would not like to talk about the school, the Bengal no, school, no, no. because this sounds about doctrine, <coughs> about theory. Mm -hmm. It's a stream, and there are many streams. There are thousands and hundreds in this country, and each and every architect working today seems to have an own opinion, but still <coughs> there is a movement going in, in one direction. <coughs> what direction? It has to be figured out, but I would call it its somehow the Bengal moment in architecture. What this is, we could discuss maybe later. Okay, so you're saying what is happening right now or in the last 20, 30 years, that's the Bengal moment in architecture? I would say it's still here. I would say it happened centuries back. It happened okay. uh, when modernity came into the country, but it's still here. <laughs> somehow there is a, um, a common thing behind all these works. Okay. Where it doesn't matter if you work commercially or um, for an NGO. Um, I think behind every project there is that sense for your own roots and for the soil here mm -hmm. without being regionalist. Right. I would not say this is a critical <coughs> regionalism today still. It's much more. It's more a critical uh, internationalism. Okay. Um, okay. In, in, somehow. But each and every work seemed to be rooted in, 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 in the culture of 
Bengal or Bangladesh. Uh, we will see later on some examples. Maybe I can explain my observations on that. Okay, so if you'll allow me, Nicholas, and I thought that I would show a series of slides and this mini presentation. Like, you know, if you're going to be talking about a stream, when does it uh, begin? Or is it a succession of streams? So kind of a historical uh, narrative, you know, if you like. So uh, what I'm going to show is not quite chronological, but thematic. And I think it's important for us to realize that, uh, you know, to look at it in perspective. Because for me, it's very criti critical to point out that modernism in Bangladesh, you know, immediately, you know, we, when we talk about modernism in Bangladesh, we will pull up this image, obviously. Mazarul Islam, the art college, the Dhaka University Library, and perhaps uh, Louis Kahn, you know, right, right after. Mazar Islam began in the 50s, Khan came in the 60s, and you know, uh, this, this was a bit of an uh, uh, interconnection between the two. Mazar Islam single-handedly, we say that over and over again, uh, established architectural modernism when he was just a young man of 30 years old, which is incredible. We, don't, we, we uh, see photographs of Mazar Islam and always he looks like this wise old man. But he was 30 years old when he designed that building. And uh, if you uh, had a chance, if any of you have an opportunity to see the working drawings and all this of this particular building, incredible, so meticulous. But then uh, he was, yes, uh, and uh, we have been able to document conversations with Mazar Islam, which came out as a book, Conversations with Mazar Islam, um, and where he is emphatic that, you know, on the one hand, he, he doesn't talk quite talk about regionalism, you're right. Uh, but he does talk about being a Bengali. But it's very tricky. It's not quite in the nationalist sense. It's quite in the Rabindranath Tagore sense, you know, this fidelity to Bengal, Bengali culture, uh, not in a political sense, but of course, you know, Mazar Islam is you know, very much deeply uh, devoted to political culture. But also at the same time, to be a world man, to be a Bengali and a world man at the same time. So. What I have also mentioned, that architectural modernism may have began with Mazar islam and with all these sort of events around Louis Kahn, Paul Rudolph, and others, but cultural modernity begins in Bengal, not just quite Bangladesh, 100 years before that. So that's the stream, and we have to, we have to uh, notice that. I would even say it starts much earlier. If you go back to these things here, um, mm -hmm. the, the base of that stream is rooted even in old cultures, and that's something which is maybe particular for the Delta. You had a lot of different cultures arriving here. Okay. Um, well, Buddhist. Sure. Uh, Sure. Hindu and, 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 and it ended up with kind of this. Well, I'll come to that. Mm -hmm. uh, but you're, I'm glad that you pulled up the Buddhist monument, which can be historically dated, or the mosques and other um, the monumental architecture. But then there are the non-monumental kind of architecture, the vernacular architecture of the everyday, which has its uh, place in the history of modern architecture here, and which has not been quite clearly narrated or analyzed. And uh, I show this image, the, the, this particular structure, quite unique for Bangladesh. You don't see that anymore. The, the crafting has died down, died away and all that. But this particular roof form was known as the Bangla roof. It had other names, but one of the way to describe that would be the Bangla. The reason I show this is because from the Bangla evolved the image on the right, or the architectural type on the right, which came to, know, came to be known as the bungalow. So, and, and it's the English translation, or modification, or interpretation of this anonymous rural thatch hut. And I find it quite interesting also. So before the advent of architectural modernism, you have this phenomenon where a rural vernacular type was reinvented into a new type which had global circulation eventually, the bungalow. 
And so this, well, we seem to know this, but I think we I need to emphasize this. And then still, heading back to the monuments, I think even the monuments were pretty much inspired by the, by the bungalow, because you find the mosque not being in, implemented in a courtyard, like in, 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 in Turkey, or, uh, or you have a single standing structure, or the temple in Kantanagar, Hindu temple, which is nothing else than the, the pavilion. Uh, and it yes. seems that the bungalow, even there, the hut, the roof, the yes. first roof is clearly visible. So this bungalow is not only, I would say, present in right. the so, right. So that's why uh, the, that subtitle, the paradigm of the pavilion form. Because in this particular climate, the hot, humid climate, the most ideal condition to be architecturally is just a roof with no walls. Uh, cross ventilation if you want to look at it just technically but also from there you could actually lead it on to a relationship with the landscape this sort of you know the pavilion is not just an isolated object it immediately sets up a relationship with the landscape you know so uh, when we talk about when uh, we or you talk about the Bangla or the bungalow and this is why I'm showing the images of the lower level uh, the lower two images on the left and the right on the left is a sort of a um, hypothetical image of you know a couple in a bungalow and one on the right is the uh, you know the English men uh, in Bengal served by the natives you know in this sort of the veranda like situation and the invention of the veranda also the veranda is that sort of mediatory space between outside and inside so uh, w what I'm saying is that the, it's not the bangla itself but the pavilion type ha as having generated architecture from the vernacular to the monumental across history whether Buddhist uh, temples Hindu temples mosques or other kind of architecture. Mm -hmm. That's true. And we have written about that also in one of the exhibitions that we did, Pundra Nagori, Sherbangla Nagori. I'll come to that. But what I'm also pointing out is that from the pavilion form um, evolved a whole series of architectural type, the pavilion type. And I show this, and I'm not sure if many of you know this. This is from Paul Rudolph's uh, Mamin Singh Agriculture University. Uh, I'm not showing the other buildings. And Paul Rudolph also in, in that campus, uh, his designs are really based on keeping the, uh, the pavilion-like principle alive in all of his buildings. But this is literally the pavilion, the sports pavilion. And also then I show this because the pavilion doesn't have to have a thatch roof. That's immaterial, as long as it behaves and performs like a pavilion. And so the one on the right is the Nipa building, which I think almost all of you know. And and uh, even Corbusier in Ahmedabad, you know, that's a pavilion type of building, but perhaps well, I think maybe in a hot, dry climate you, would, you might need some other things. So, um, and I could go on to the other point that, uh, so the pavilion form, isolated object in the landscape, uh, one th object, that's not the challenge. Uh, the challenge is then how do you group them together, right? Um, so, and again, uh, Mazarul Islam, modern times, the five polytechnics he designed with Stanley Tigerman in the 60s, and that led to uh, the two of them writing this very important sort of, uh, they produced a uh, report, which was part of it was published in the Architectural Record in 19, I can't read that, uh, late 60s. Um, so uh, then it comes to this whole business of tropical architecture, you know, so the, the moment you start discussing the performance of buildings in climate in hot, humid places, tropical architecture. So there is that strand. Um, and it, so I, I think I make a strong point about that also. So from the Bangla to the bungalow, and then it was in London, this, the School of Tropical Architecture was established. Uh, with sort of this uh, roots of the whole interrogation of what is a building in a tropical place having come from Bengal or Bangladesh and then having spread across the British Empire and all that and which in London becomes the center for the study of tropical architecture. I don't know why, but it did. And Masrul Islam went there to Masrul study Islam went there. tropical architecture. So, so that's one strand. Understanding um, <laughs> 
And, and uh, I'm sure I don't have to emphasize this too much. Uh, the school of tropical architecture was really based on a sort of a metrical principle, the performance, uh, heat gain, cross ventilation, size, and wind pressure, and all that, eaves, louvers. So it was very quantifiable way of looking at architecture, scientific or quasi-scientific or techno-scientific, uh, which is what be it became. And then it traveled back to Bangladesh. You know, if uh, I don't know how the architecture education is set up now, but when we went to school. Climate was a big operation, you know. That was the, so the, the biggest parameter against which your work was measured. Okay. Um, this is a project by Saiful Haq and Jalal Ahmed who are here. Um, because I go back to not just the performance of the single building, it becomes a challenge when you take the pavilion type and you start to think of assemblies, clusters, groups, in open areas is one thing, and then when you take it to the city, that's another thing. So the challenge remains. How to have your building perform as a pavilion, not literally, in all of these conditions, from uh, rural areas to congested urban areas to tall buildings to big complexes to big fat buildings. Like, is the parliament building a pavilion? It is. Well. So it doesn't have to look like a pavilion as long as it performs as a pavilion, right? It's a type. Which is interesting because Khan did two projects in the subcontinent in two different climatic environments. Uh, one in uh, Dhaka, hot humid, and other in Ahmedabad, mostly hot dry. And if you notice that in Dhaka, and so Khan was very clear about what he was going to do. In Dhaka, it's, it's not just this huge, humongous, monumental building coming out of the ground, it's a pavilion. And in Ahmedabad, it's a set of uh, spaces around the courtyard, which is what you need to do in hot, dry climate. So, typologically, he was on the... Uh, well, on and the maybe track. Khan already did more <coughs> than a pavilion. He already did a kind of a, a cluster. Of course. You can read it in both ways. I, I, I right think you can, uh, you can have it... Sure. Well, you, you see it as one pavilion, but you can also read it as uh, the, the, the Bengal uh, village. The cluster of totally. different uh, buildings gathering around the sure. interior uh, courtyard. No, I mean, courtyard. No, I mean, if you look at this plan here, which is yeah. right here, um, uh, the assembly building is a cluster of volumes. And uh, he started off with a square plan. And then he started to give definition to each of the corners. And the, corn and the various volumes started to drift away. So, uh, and I have described this as a tension between coming together and being pulled apart. So, centripetal and centrifugal. And not only that, then there are the other buildings beyond the assembly. So, there, it, I know, there's this sort of beautiful tension between, yes, coming together and being pulled away. Um, so, but going back to climate, and uh, I show here two naked men. Uh, <laughs> Why are these men naked? <laughs> uh, no, I pulled this image up because I did this presentation in Malaysia about like 15 years ago, and they, it was a great conference. It was called Cool Practice, you know, the question of climate, what life was like before air condition came in. And this whole sort of uh, practices have changed, rituals have changed. Uh, I don't know how Gandhi would have fared today, but this is Corbusier, you know, when he went to the south of France in the summer times and he would paint like that. Uh, and Gandhi would run his wheels. Uh, but climate, you know, so uh, as I was saying that climate became in the understanding of tropical architecture a very metrical thing, measurable and all that. But not all, you know, so climate need not be like that. Because in Bangladesh, and I, I think everywhere, you know, um, Climate is the fundament against which we are. You, I, Switzerland, Bangladesh. Uh, that, I mean, I'm not saying that it's a deterministic thing, that we are who we are because of the climate, but climate is all we have. Um, it does, uh, there is a reciprocal relationship between who we are and where the environment is. So climate will be the fundamental sort of condition against which 
this sort of reciprocal relationship happens, will always happen. We are never ever without climate. I, I, I like the word environment because we're environed. There's never ever a moment where, when we are not environed. I can't even imagine one. Um, so I think I, uh, architecture, uh, so bodily we are like that, that we are always environed. And so is architecture, so is the building. But we didn't conceive buildings as independent, isolated, abstract things. And then we try to construct them as such. We imagine them as such, and then we try to construct them as such, but they never are. They're always environed. So I think it's important to... So the pavilion type, perhaps other types also, but more than other types, and I'm interested in the pavilion type, makes you really realize that you're environed. And I love this image, and I'm saying continuity because my task has been for the last 25 years or 30 years, 30 years, has been um, constantly revis revisit the question of what, uh, well, well, what is the essence of architecture in Bang Bangladesh or Bengal? And I started off with looking at this pavilion form, but I discovered this image. Have you seen this image? You know, it's in your book. And I had it published before. It's called the Bangla Ragini. It's a miniature painting done, I believe, in the 18th century or late 17th from the Bundi school. It's called the Bangla Ragini. And if you can see the image, uh, a yogi is sitting in a structure, which is a pavilion. Uh, so, but I think this, uh, this is interesting. This is part of a painting series in the miniature tradition uh, from the Ragamala series, Ragmala, Ragamala. Um, the paintings are supposed to represent a particular musical type, a raga. This is a ragini. So this is a visual depiction of the musical raga. And then on the top you see a script, which is a description of the musical raga. So it's a beautiful um, exercise in combining three genres, the literary, the visual, and the musical but they're all like trying to represent the musical. But in this case, they're trying to represent an environment, Bengal. And uh, it's showing not an isolated pavilion, it's showing the pavilion in a setting. And I don't know if you can see it clearly, it's in a very dark, dank, humid condition. Lushly grown trees, and there are details of plants, insects, and as you can see, a kind of cloud arising in the background, you know, coming up the monsoon, I suppose. So um, I thought that would be, in the sort of the Western European tradition, um, when you think about really instructive or um, paradigmatic image of the origin of architecture, you think of Logier's primitive hut, so this is Bengal's primitive hut, if you like, but it's not just the isolated primitive hut in the setting. So I thought that's a great one. But uh, so climate is not just a technical fact, but it's the, it's what you have. Um, and I show this, uh, not all of it is related to Bangladesh particularly, but as long as we are talking, so I'm saying that, you know, where does the stream start, you know? Uh, the beginning of tropical architecture, the metrical understanding, but behind the metrical understanding is a deep-seated, uh, intimate relationship between building and the environment. Maybe uh, at this point um, there might be a question, why am I or we in, in the Western uh, Hemisphere so much yes. interested in architecture right. um, that happens over here. You're very much emphasizing that the pavilion uh, is driven from the climate. Climate is basically the source of that stream. But I think we, um, or as I read it, what is interesting to us with a totally different climate where we <coughs> could not use the pavilion, it's the fact that the pavilion is porous. And it is not only porous in a climatic sense, it is porous in a spatial sense, of course, due to the climate. Mm -hmm. But I think the porosity is something which uh, is an interesting aspect in architecture in general, 
Is it here? Is it um, in the West? It doesn't matter where. I think it's a fundamental principle. And porosity, not only in a, in a spatial sense, but I think porosity in a sense of, um, or in a social sense as well. That's something uh, I notice in architecture here, that there is a quite a, a, a big porosity in a, in a social sense. Well, this is a great image to yeah. illustrate that. It's um, the pavilion somehow, yes, it comes from the climate, but what right. interests me a lot about this type or the architecture here is the porosity through right. society. It's not only one uh, client or one segment which is benefiting today of architecture here in the country. It's many different uh, segments of the so society. There is a middle class growing, there is a high society, there is a luxury class, but there is people who have not um, wealth in an in a, in a economical sense, but still architects here in Bangladesh, they work at that front as well. This is something we have maybe forgotten in the West. Mm -hmm. And this is a me message uh, our exhibition also would like to bring to um, the audience in the West. Sure. Where is our uh, interaction, <coughs> where are, is our architecture still porous with society. Mm. That's one thing. So, uh, uh, Nicholas, help me understand. So, you're mm. saying that in Switzerland, things have become more segmented, segregated, and each cluster is not talking to each other, and architects perhaps are talking to a particular group of clusters, right. not taking notice of others. Exactly. That's, that's and in Bangladesh, you find that, okay, you know, because of the global economy or, you know, the whole political and economic system, similar clusters, are happening or have you know is still there but architects are responding to all the clusters yeah but um i mean okay it might be a particular situation here you have uh, more uh, different levels of society than we have maybe yes. but still i think we also in europe in switzerland we, we have a lot of problems that could be solved by architecture mm. but a but lot of can you mention what you know uh, more well specifically it's maybe not uh a natural disaster or mm. uh, refugee. Okay, mm. this is still there, of course. So vulnerable communities. Yeah, things or also social uh, social um, problems in right. society, right. which could be solved by architects. Okay. And today we have shifted that to other specialists, no, to no. psychiatrists. So to definitely, so that's <laughs> a strand Not in Bangladesh. Yes, sure. Uh, and you mean that. Uh, I mean, do, do, would you like to show some images that you may have of projects that are of that nature? I mean, I, I yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe yeah. I can I can switch to some of the images. Let me but see. while you uh, do that, I just wanted to point out to this image. Uh, it's a painting by a very well-known Bangladeshi artist, painter, Kamrul Hassan. And this uh, hung in on the wall of Mazharul Islam studio, his personal studio. And I... And I'm going back to the, uh, the Bangla Ragini image and, you know, what you mentioned, porosity, but, uh, you know, I, I'm also looking at porosity here, or continuity, if you like, uh, or continuum between buildings and buildings, buildings outside, insides, buildings and spaces, building and nature, building people, you know, there's a sort of a uh, almost transparency between all those things. So um, this is one image I would like to reflect on more at some point. Okay. I have chosen uh, this image now of that uh, emergency school. This is uh, designed by a young, uh, young uh, architecture firm, uh, Gorami Yon. Mm. And I think it's a very good example how architects can contribute to any level of society. Right. There was a disaster, the school was destroyed. These guys took an initiative um, to create a wonderful piece of architecture. It's not just an emergency shelter. Right. But it refers again to the pavilion. Right. It has a poetic aspect. It refers to the program. You could read the saris of the girls, which are in that space, uh, seeing the colorful sheets, plastic sheets. Right. You know, I would say in our country, if we have to deal with something like that, we would put just a container. Not, not, not a big deal about detailing, about poet, poesy, poetics. That's something we have forgotten. Here I find it in, in many of 
projects, even if it's a provisional thing, even if it's a low-cost thing. Right. Um, architectural means are here. Space, proportion, light, color, materials, all these things. I think this is a, this is a value which you have right. in the contemporary scene. Because you can do it here? No, I think Nader Khalili, the Iranian architect, uh, he mentioned once that um, homelessness I mean, he was an Iranian architect. He was saying that in Iran, or in this case in Bangladesh, there is no homelessness. People can go f somewhere and make something. But you can't do that in Switzerland. And the irony is that, you know, because there are laws and regulations, and, you know, you need to have a permit and all that. You can't just go and build anything anywhere. People did that 200 years ago, but not anymore. So as we progress, and you know, one kind of progress, uh, for the safety and well-being of the community. Then you have laws and regulations, and then you're stuck with the laws and regulations, and then the movement of the architectural practice becomes a school, restricted, which hasn't happened yet in Bangladesh. I mean, there are laws, it's not a lawless place, but then there are ways to maneuver around that. And then there are groups of architects who are inspired to go and work with communities where it's not a regular commission, they are dedicated, inspired to go and work there. And, um, you know, I, I can mention the name of Anna Herringer and Khandagar Hasibul Kabir, who have made remarkable, um, I, I call them embedded architects, you know, the, because, you know, it's not about doing a design on the desk, but you go and live there, work with the community, uh, create rapport, and, uh, and work with whatever resources are out there. So I think it's a remarkable, uh, and, and a group of, a lot of young architects are involved in Bangladesh and working in various places in, uh, in disturbed landscapes with uh, communities, you know, who otherwise would not have such kind of... Yeah, same uh, example here, Dinajpur, yes. the slum yes. upgrading by, by um, SAFE. Uh, I think very much inspired by the typology of Anna Herringer's school, but um, I just went to see it uh, two right. weeks ago. It's very impressive how this brings architecture into that milieu of the, of the uh, informal uh, right. uh, settlements there. Um, often, maybe perhaps in the definition or understanding of architecture, in Western framework, mm -hmm. not always quite so, perhaps more. I mean, we, we say architecture immediately, we begin to describe it as a tectonic operation, right? Uh, so there's a too, much, uh, too much emphasis, overemphasis on the tectonic operation, mm -hmm. Kenneth Frampton. Mm -hmm. And we, we had a discussion with Kenneth Frampton in Hong Kong, you know, uh, where I was invited to, and I, I deliberately actually presented Kabir's work because you can't understand Kabir's work through tectonic definition of architecture. Number one, it's often very atectonic or non-tectonic, uh, almost the disappearance of architecture in some of his cases. And then how do you then engage it uh, in the terms that we use for architecture? So perhaps works like this expand the scope of architecture. Right? I think that this is, uh, again, the porosity, you know, um, architecture being a porous thing, not, not, not manifest as a tectonic, stable kind of building, but it can be a social action. Because or if you don't tell the story of this particular project, uh, people will not get it. Mm. I mean, if without that explanation, this is just a shack of mm. some sort. But it's a piece of architecture. No, no, it's and of course it is. So, uh, well, what we are perhaps saying, agreeing, is that uh, the scope of architecture in Bangladesh does not have to be defined through tectonic means all the time. Not all the time. I think there is, that is, that's one branch, one stream, uh, which is very uh, strong and very um, interesting, uh, very contemporary, I think, the, the act of co-creating uh, interaction with the client, interaction with the community, right. and not uh, being an author, but mm -hmm. taking back your, your signature. I remember Kobier once mentioning in a, in a conversation that for him a good, uh, good architecture, or he's successful when nobody 
um, is aware that there was an architect. That's right. uh, and he says some, sometime our work is a work in the shadow. Right. Well, this is very uh, impressive. I think th that's also something we have forgotten uh, in the West because architecture there is always about signature. Signature and a kind of robustness and a kind of flamboyance, yes. spectacularity. Exactly. You know, I think, well, it may have its place, not that you can deny that, but I think how do we, how do we then uh, assess works of Kabir's in this manner? Um, so that's uh, one recognition of the challenges that architects have taken up. So uh, right now we have already bypassed a whole body of work, <laughs> which is about being robust and I wouldn't say flamboyant, but you know, uh, that's one group of work which is very well uh, represented in your exhibition and book. Uh, then we're jumping on to uh, one challenge that architects have taken on very strongly and very, uh, you know, with good dem demonstration of what is, what architects are capable of doing, uh, being the, uh, to say that community architecture is not good enough, you know, I, I call them embedded architect because most mm -hmm. of them go and live there, mm -hmm. work with the community, mm -hmm. you know, so that's a different kind of a challenge. But I have to say that, you know, we can also shift to the other challenge which I have articulated is at this scale, you know, the scale of the city, the scale of the larger landscape, you know. So that's a challenge that is already here. The things that are happening to Dhaka City, for example, at that urban level, the metropolitan urban, urban level, uh, urban level at other smaller scales, and the larger landscape, you know, which... Um, you know, so I mentioned Dhaka. Dhaka could be, and Dhaka is, um, an opportunity to rethink the scope of architecture or architects, uh, and I said Dhaka is a theorem, you know. Uh, it's very distinctive, you know. Uh, you can't compare easily Dhaka with another city. But then Dhaka is about this, you know. This is, I use this as a classic image that how Dhaka is being built, rebuilt, transformed, modulated by that instrument. You know that, yeah. and we all know that. And uh, that is changing Dhaka barges carrying sand and, um, and, and the landscape is changing uh, in a disastrous way. And I think so uh, on to the next scale is, you know, the whole sort of understanding Dhaka and the larger scale through where it is geographically in Bangladesh. Uh, and it's not just a geography, but it's a hydrogeography. And I, I'm making it a practice that I always sort of uh, add hydro to the geography and this whole business of land and water, which is, an, again, uh, my own. And at the Bengal Institute, that's what we are working on very, uh, very methodically and uh, deeply. Uh, this is a map that, uh, you know, so I think at this scale, uh, before you go into what we might call architecture, or interventions or proposals, I think a whole set of new ways of Analyzing, studying, interpreting the landscape is needed before we can uh, start to make, well, interventions or innovations. So this is a map, and you have seen this before, uh, water flows. This is a stream mapping. So just an example, and you have to deal with that, and I don't see that as a disaster, but this is a condition you have to work with. Um, and, uh, well, people already know how to deal with life in this situation. Not to romanticize this, but, but that's the condition. You can't push water away. Water is very fundamental to um, living in this hydrogeography. Um, people uh, living with that condition seem to have understood but while, we, you know, you, you mentioned clusters. So what I emphasize is that we in the city, we do not. Uh, we are reproducing models whereby we are pushing away the landscape or the dynamics of the landscape. We're pushing away water and that cannot be. So we're picking up wrong models. Um, then maybe we, we can switch to that one. Okay. Talking about water and land and the contradiction of water and land. I think this So you need new paradigms. Yeah. This is a building or whatever it is, architecture, a structure, that mm -hmm. deals with both in a yes. very sophisticated way and somehow <coughs> very easily get rid of that contradiction. So again, this is not about being spectacular, no, but it is about performance. Exactly. 
in this particular sort of dynamics, mm -hmm. uh, shifting, changing mm -hmm. landscape. You know, okay. water recedes, water goes away, but then you have to have your fundamental architectural condition. And again, it's a pavilion <coughs> somehow, or a cluster of pavilions, let's yes, say, somehow. Yes, yes. Um, on the other hand, it's uh, inspired by the boats, the, shi uh, the ships, uh, the culture of boat making, which is here uh, in the Delta. <coughs> and I think this is a very uh, innovative um, approach. Uh, we can learn a lot from, also in the West, although we do not have uh, floods or conditions like here, but the way of thinking, um, how Seifel Hawk has thought about mm -hmm. this contradiction of land and water and not, 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 seeing, a not seeing a contradiction, but, mm -hmm. but seeing it right. as a, something you can merge. Right. Um, this is something we can learn from a lot, because I think architecture today is very categoric. Mm -hmm. Either it's a structure or it's informal or, I don't know, we are thinking in these boxes. And I think this project is not thinking in a box. <coughs> It can be read in, in a very different um, uh, point of view. Mm. Uh, it, it can sit on the land, it's, then it's a pavilion, it can be floating, it's a boat. And the most important thing, I think, again, that architecture can solve a problem, the problem of a lack of education, for example. In a mm. landscape where mm. it's very dif difficult to get education, during um, flood season. So all of a sudden a school can be <coughs> in a place where it never appeared right. before right. without being a boat. Because if it was a boat, then the problem can, comes up again what happens when flood is not there. So I think this is a very good example um, of an architectural approach giving an answer to education. Mm. Um, well, there are other examples. Uh, this is not a boat. The architect is here. But this is, this is not a boat. Yeah, but this is a boatish. It's <laughs> <Yes>, boaty. <laughs> um, but then there are uh, schools on boats, literally, and which you have shown in your exhibition. And which, uh, you know, like uh, three years ago when I was working on the locations book, and I had a portfolio in Bangladesh. Um, and I was very keen on, again, expanding the scope of what architects are doing, or even works that are not done by architects. You know, uh, there's a boat building mm. uh, that was triggered by Yves Marr, um, and then the boat school. And then now there are a lot of things, you know, the yeah. boat hospital, hospital. And, uh, you know, and so on and so forth. Uh, floating vegetable gardens, which people are doing, so it, it's uh, quite established by mm. now. Um, no, but uh, what made me realize while doing that three years ago is that, uh, again, like the community-based operations, this kind of things that are happening at the edge of conventional architecture mm -hmm. or formal architecture are these things, uh, floating schools, floating hospitals, or at that time not yet. Um, and that, I see that as architecture. That's clearly architecture. And I, you know, I, I lived in uh, Hawaii uh, for many years. And one thing that I uh, discovered in Poly you know, Hawaii being a Polynesian culture that historically there was no difference between boats and buildings. The technology of making boats and the technology of making uh, buildings is the same technology, lashing, and you can unlash. Um, and there were a lot of shared, uh, you know, uh, ways of naming boats and buildings. Mm. Um, mm. And I think uh, we may have to re revisit this, you know, so what we conventionally call architecture and what there are other things. There are know. people that um, would contradict you. Right? Yes. I know some of them here. Yes. But go well, in on. what way? <laughs> uh, that architecture is always something stable. Stable. Yes, stable, not moving. Uh, mm. I, I don't see it as such. Mm. That's why we also have presented boats, we have mm. boat models in our exhibition, things like that, but right. there is also a trend, and this is maybe another branch, which um, is here, uh, in, in, in very strong in Bangladesh, a branch that sets up something stable in the middle okay. of uh, a total 
floating, instable sure. landscape. The only stable thing or permanent thing you can find is architecture. And I think this is also one opinion that okay. should or can be uh, accepted. And, and this contradiction will come from outside Bangladesh? or from No, from, from here. From here. Okay. The, uh, one architect addressed uh, me and told me, um, well, he has seen the, uh, the book or got aware of the I exhibition. See why the boats are there? Why are the boats, are the there? boats there? And there? So well, I was okay. explaining a little bit. Because then, and uh, that person was saying that architecture needs to be stable. Yes, I can uh, totally understand his no, point of view. Uh, sure. It's a, and that's why again, it's a stream. It's well, not a school. Know, uh, th that's the point about Bangladesh, and that goes back to the the hydrological landscape. Because you know, forget uh, architecture. The land is not stable. Mm, exactly. I mean, you know, that's the first, you know, while I was doing my, you know, architecture design studios, that's the first understanding mm -hmm. that I want to give students about the landscape in Bangladesh. It's not stable. Look at that edge, you know, you can see that it's uh, eroding, but will be made again next year in some other form. And you have to live with that. Mm -hmm. It's a very, I mean, you know, if you want to call it, describe it beautifully, it's dynamic, but uh, it's also cataclysmic. Mm -hmm. But then people live with that dynamic cataclysmic scenario mm -hmm. and uh, nothing is stable and that's the first sort of condition so if we living in Dhaka want to make it stable that's a fiction mm -hmm. because you never can you never it can will always move you never it, it's mm -hmm. moving it's mm -hmm. eroding and floods come every year mm -hmm. and when the floods come we suffer for two months and then the water goes away and we think that okay fine we're stable now mm -hmm. And then we wait for the next round. But I think it, the step was needed before you <coughs> come up with these solutions. There was a step needed right. uh, to talk about uh, permanence. You know, um, if you live in an unstable ground, somehow you. I don't you think we should. Uh, we should not use the word. And I'm, not, I'm not saying that to you, but I think we have to revise this terminologies by which we understand architecture: permanence, stable. I don't think you can have it. Yeah, I wa I'm only saying what right. this guy mentioned. Okay. I, no, I fully understand his opinion because, first right. of all, you may need a shelter. Um, uh, you may need something which seems to be stable. I'm not talking about something destroying the landscape or right. blocking the water. But the work that you are showing here and then the other work before, I think we need to first recognize the expansion of the scope of architecture in Bangladesh. Exactly, yes. Uh, and that's sure. primarily the most important thing. Mm -hmm. Within that, there may be some body, some work which is like relatively stable. You know, mm -hmm. nothing is stable, first of all. And then there are others which are working in a very dynamic situation. So if we are trained, if we are indoctrinated, uh, through this idea that architecture needs to be stable, we'll never be able to counter or work with the dynamic conditions. Mm -hmm. And uh, unfortunately, before architects moved into that dynamic conditions, people have been inventive about that. Mm -hmm. okay? no, so architects in Bangladesh, or the landscape architects in Bangladesh, did not come up with the idea of floating gardens. No, people it was did people that. first. People did that. Exactly. Okay. So I think, you know, we may have to learn from what's going on at the edge, learning from the edge, not from the center. Exactly. But, but still, I think architecture had to go through that journey. Um, and maybe these <coughs> new trends or new streams, new waves appear now, right. since um, there had been work on other ideas uh, which failed or <coughs> which are not necessary anymore. Mm -hmm. Maybe there is situations or more under control, I don't know. Maybe uh, we have, uh, there were improvements in the landscape, <coughs> floods and so on. Society getting more uh, stable, I don't know. So you, you can, you can uh, well, you approach know, well, something you more instable. I think, again. Uh, let me give you one example of that stable stability is a fiction. I mean, look at Dhan Mundi. It was designed for um, plots mm -hmm. with bungalow style houses mm -hmm. in the late 50s 60s it doesn't exist anymore no now you have the tall no, buildings no. well first first you did the five six story apartment buildings and now you're going for the 10 
14 mm. stories. So what is stable about, you know, the architectural type here? Mm. Um, so, uh, yeah, and this is a flux in terms of economy and desire. Mm. So I think to perceive something stable, I think that's a, that's a myth. Okay, so uh, um, the other thing that I wanted to sh point out is that, uh, and we, this is, goes back to where should we start? And I think this is again for some of the younger friends here. They may or may not know um, that, um, well, many architecture schools or individuals or organizations are, you know, and there are social media uh, communities which are doing incredible things in terms of uh, going around documenting historical architecture, uh, mapping old buildings. But this is not a very, uh, you know, this is happening very recently. This is what I mean by historical consciousness, you know, the, the awareness of what is out there in terms of, I know you showed some examples of Buddhist monuments and all that, but to uh, engage with history, now we are talking about history, not quite the landscape and other things. Uh, this is a recent phenomenon, and in Bangladesh, this has happened within a historical framework, and we need to identify that. And in your book, you have mentioned the Chetana Architecture Society, which was instrumental. Um, it's a very important moment. That's a moment. Okay, so um, some of you may know about it well enough, and some maybe a little bit, but I think this needs to be established. And we haven't done enough to establish this point because it has already become a memory. But Chetana was very much instrumental in establishing what I would like to call the historical consciousness. And you might find it remarkable, and some of you may find it remarkable, that when we were going to school, you know, there was no evidence of uh, historical architecture in Bangladesh in a book form. Uh, there's, there were some books written by non-architects, non you know, rather poor books, and no sort of systematic, serious documentation. It's, like David McCutcheon, you know, that, that sort of documentation. There was none. Um, no engagement with archaeology. There's, well, there's no evidence. So you mentioned that, uh, I think you mentioned it earlier, that, you know, it's a humus, right? But we had no idea about that. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying right now, uh, it seems that it was evident. Mm -hmm. It wasn't. Mm -hmm. Before the 1980s, it wasn't evident that, well, here is this historical uh, background, but we had no access to it because there was no books, there was no documentation, there was no evidence. So I think this is a very important one for uh, establishing the historical facts, and I have a similar image, and uh, to make a point that the stream relies on past streams, our moments, or this was a wave, I would say a little wave, because since then, since Chetona did that big exhibition in 1997, it came out with a book, and I think I have some images, right? That was at the opening, the image on the right. Uh, Shaukat Osman, who, a, who was a very well-known writer, um, he and others opened the exhibition, and I think it made a huge mark. And from that moment on, I would say it uh, affected um, a lot of young architects, or as well as that time practicing architects in engaging with history. And engaging with, uh, you know, to, and, and that's not an e just an easy thing. And I think in, in the book on the cover, as you can see that we have a Buddhist monument, we have a Hindu temple, we have a mosque, and we have then uh, Khan's assembly building. Bit rhetorical, right? Mm. Um, the, as if, you know, Khan to Buddhist mon monasteries, there's a continuity. But nonetheless, it's a food for thought. We thought we would like to make this argument, and uh, you know, and with the production of the book, I think uh, we were on to opening up uh, windows to history. Picking up that, um, <coughs> I'm coming um, to the exhibition in Basel. Um, as I said in the beginning, um, it's. We have to look back to understand contemporary architecture because it's a, a, a continuity, a stream, and this is the first thing you see when you come into the museum. Mm -hmm. So it's somehow a similar 
approach what Chetana did with um, that cover. Yes. But we go on with that story. We do not stop with Louis Kahn, but we go on, for example, in the sense of we also uh, contemporary buildings in this row, for example, this one, <coughs> or that one, this one. You seem to favor square buildings, Nicholas. You sure? Yeah. Look at that. Well, it's like and look coming at that. out of a square. Oh, yeah. Well, and it's, it's amazing. When the visitor comes, you can ask him which one well, is from well, what we year. Did, we did a square format, you know, like <laughs> four square. And some, some people cannot tell you whether this is a contemporary building or whether this is an old monument. And this is somehow very uh, astonishing that this tradition of <coughs> typologies is living on. But the That's typologies right. are transferred into, a new, um, into the new times. I mean, they're transformed not in a literal sense, but more in a um, sense of the content. Mm -hmm. what, what, does the type, what was the typology before and what is it today? And so the history or of this um, stream uh, the base of that history we are explaining through the eyes of Masrul Islam and Chetana Group. That's our starting point. We are not going back to the really beginning, but we are looking through the eyes of <coughs> people who have done a survey 20 years back. And coincidentally, the exhibition on um, the Chitana exhibition was exactly 20 years before our opening, December 1997. We opened in December 2017. And people working uh, on the Chitana exhibition, the Chitana book, like you, Saif, and others, Rasiul, Rasiul mm -hmm. they are now presented in our contemporary section. So this is one of the proofs that that base, that research, <coughs> led to um, something new. It did not have an effect that you were stuck in history, mm -hmm. like historians somehow are, but you managed to escape from that um, survey and brought to bring it into, into uh, today's life. This is something very fascinating, as, uh, I think, and that's why we dedicated that first space of the exhibition to the <coughs> Chetana group. We have um, these drawings here, original drawings, which are also um, presented in the Chetana book. Right. We have, of course, copies of the Chetana book. We also have um, copies of the Khan book, which came out 15 years ago, which was published by you and Saif. So these are all traces that, at the end, lead to the um, contemporary architecture, which then is displayed back here in a complete uh, different uh, scenographic set, uh, setting and which we will see a little bit later. Right. So the book that you are talking about, the other books, so the, uh, the, the big Chetana uh, exhibition happened in 1997. The, the top right image is from the opening, but the image on the, this particular image, that's actually from 2002 when we did the exhibition on uh, Louis Kahn and the assembly complex. So I would say uh, that was like two back to back. Well, 1997, 2002 marked um, a major moment, I would say, in uh, establishing an understanding of contemporary architecture in Bangladesh. So that's uh, architecturally speaking. But I have to say a few things that uh, I think the you know there is one thing: architectural modernism in architecture, and then cult cultural modernity. And I think uh, I, I'm personally invested in that topic and I would suggest that all of you might want to think about that, you know, what it means to be a modern Bengali, which Mazar Islam spoke about endlessly, to be both a Bengali and a world man. And I think you have to go back to Rabindranath Tagore and you have to go to Tagore. But the, the, then there were others and this particular work of Rabindranath, which was made into a film, Home and the World, says it all. Uh, and uh, this goes back to colonialism in that uh, home is in disarray because foreign things have come in. And mm. I say that in a broad way. And you can't be stable anymore. Mm. Okay, you have, first of all, you have to open up. 
you have to, and how do you do that? Uh, which I described in an old essay, then you are thrust into this business of acceptance and resistance of two things, accepting what is foreign to you, you have to, and also accepting what belongs to you. Because when you are working within a tradition, this is my belief, without any external um, infiltration, you don't think about tradition. Only when you are engaged in one way or another, whether in a violent form as colonialism or trade or other things. I mean, right now, no spot on the planet is insular. Mm -hmm. But then there were moments 200 years ago, there were insular communities. So tradition is something that you don't think about when you're within the tradition. That's home. But then there's the world which arrives at your doorsteps. And as uh, Tagore said, you have to, and Gandhi said, you have to open the windows. Mm -hmm. Because if you close the doors, then you're talking about petty nationalism or fascistic nationalism. But then that's what Bengali intellectuals are doing in the late 19th century, in the early part of the last century. How do you traverse acceptance and resistance, accepting foreign things? And there are different people accepting different foreign things, and there were debates among them, intellectual debates, you know. Mm -hmm. So that, that was like a great sort of moment in Bengali cultural history. And also historical consciousness opened up. Historical consciousness only opens up when you have seen foreign things. When all of a sudden you realize, you know, and I say, I've mentioned this before in Basel, it's the narcissus moment. You mm -hmm. see yourself in the mirror, mm -hmm. you're over there. Mm -hmm. So it's a very troublesome thing, you know, it's no longer you are one whole and you can never be. You see yourself over there and you want to make this sort of connection. But see, that this can is never another be. reason doing an exhibition on right. Bangladesh, Absolutely. showing it in the West, right. um, because it's a mirror for both sides, you right. know. Right. I'm showing my colleagues what's going on here, and we, right. can, we can learn a lot about us. But I'm also explaining a little bit about architecture in Bangladesh with Western eyes. And you sure. also That's have right. a mirror no, no. Uh, totally. in front of you. I think it's totally. a double mirror. It's on <laughs> totally, <the b> <laughs> totally. It's a reflection forth and back. So no, uh, I think it, it makes alive, again, this whole business of acceptance and resistance, because exhibitions are moments of self-reflection. Okay. Right? First of all, when these things are put together, you, you know, it's not just you go there and you enjoy or your work is shown or not shown, but uh, I think it's a moment of self-reflection. Okay. Any major exhibitions like mm -hmm. this, and they're highly critical, very important for the next round. Mm -hmm. So I mentioned acceptance, but there, there's also resistance. Resist. You need to make sure that, well, you need to make sure, meaning you know, it's individual decision, you know, what you need to push away. Push away foreign things and push away traditional things. Not everything in tradition is to be accepted. You know, in, say, in Indian traditions, in Bengali traditions, there are many things which Mazar Islam talked about endlessly, and we can talk about endlessly also. There are things that are about oppression, uh, suppression, and you, know, uh, and you need to reject those things. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you understand those things by going away, by arriving at the foreign, you often realize this needs to be critiqued. Uh, whether you do that or you do it internally doesn't matter, but then you can't accept tradition wholesale, you can't ac accept the foreign wholesale. Mm. You know, I, I think it's through moments of self-reflectivity you arrive at such moments. <coughs> I wanted to show this because uh, this is again Tagore in Japan, uh, a great, you know, it's a very interesting moment and this is uh, Okakura who wrote that, I don't know, many of you may have seen that book, little book, Book of Tea. Uh, Okakura and Tagore were in a conversation about setting up this pan-Asian frontier. And I say this because, you know, pan-Asian <coughs> frontier against frontier. materialistic West, frontier. the rational materialistic West. Uh, and they argued that the East is the home of the spiritual and so on and so forth. So, I, well, that was an argument, but... Um, so, I, I, I say this and I show this because that's in the 1920s. Uh, all this sort of discourse, if you like, is happening. At the same time, this is Abhinindranath Tagore, Rabindranath Tagore's nephew, and E.B. Havel, another Englishman, and the two of them set up the Bengal School of Art in Calcutta, mm -hmm. that what should Indian art be? So uh, the point that I'm making is that before the discussion what is ba Bengali or Bangladeshi architecture should be, 
the big question was raised in, in art, right? And, and this is very important politically, and this is 1920s or even earlier. It's earlier with Ram Mohan Roy and all that, but you know, in art, the discussion was what is Indian, Indian art? Okay, and that led to what is India? Hmm. It became a political you know, question. From an artistic question, it became a cultural, a, a new definition of what is culture and a new definition of what is India, slash Bengal. And then it trickled into other literary and in architecture it came much later with Mazhar Islam in the 1950s. So I think uh, to look at this historical consciousness, it's what we did in the 80s was much late, but that's okay. But then we need, and this is part of that uh, whole trajectory, a question, film, Satyajit Ray, uh, the rural life, it's no longer stable anymore. Okay, and you move to the city, you know, this Opu, the particular character in this film, Pater Pachali, uh, he moves to the city, you know, which is this sort of new frontier, the new landscape, mm. and then you have to deal with that. Oh, this is, you know, I had forgotten this image, uh, which is not really related to what I'm saying, but the narcissist moment, that once you see yourself in the mirror, uh, things have changed. And I have a couple of other images, and I can just end with that. I have image of the Bauhaus. Nicholas? Why? Because Bauhaus was fascinated by uh, Tagore, and uh, one of the first exhibitions Bauhaus um, performed was in right. Calcutta. Right. So, right. again, waves. Yeah. I mean, the fascination of these both worlds having conversation, mm -hmm. uh, this comes mm. from time to time. And maybe now it's time again to uh, have this connection. Well, well one thing uh, is that in the s late 60s, when the architecture school was set up here, it was in the sort of the Bauhaus tradition, as most schools were in the 60s and 70s. But I think uh, there's a much more, a much more deeper connection with modern art, architecture, and ideology via the Bauhaus in Bengal, mm -hmm. uh, in Shantiniketan. Would you believe that? Bauhaus mm -hmm. and Shantiniketan? Because of this woman, Stella Kramrish, mm -hmm. which I didn't have a chance to explain in Basel, but uh, Stella Kramrish was an Austrian art historian. Um, again, it's like David McCutcheon, um, taken in by Indian art, uh, Indian traditions. Stella Cramridge became very interested in uh, Indian art. I think that's in the, again, 1920s. And she lived in London, and Tagore visited London and had heard Stella speak, and he whisked her off to Shantinikatan here. And Stella Cramridge lived there for many years, until the late 40s, until the end of the Second World War. Uh, and Stella Cramrish produced a massive literature. And the most important book is the Hindu temple, the one on the right. Uh, and, I, and I say a couple of things here. Mm. And that, that's mm. important about this transaction mm -hmm. because we are, mm. you know, or the wave or the, uh, the relationship uh, between Europe and Bangladesh. Because I think one question would be why is Switzerland interested in Bangladesh uh, other than selling chocolates, which are very <laughs> expensive. Uh, uh, the Hindu temple, uh, it's again a big fat book and the degree of scholarship, the degree of investigation, the degree of study that Stella Cramridge did in the 40s or 30s when the book was published in the 40s, I think, this has not been surpassed even now by yeah. any Indian mm -hmm. scholar. This mm -hmm. remains the benchmark. Mm -hmm. So you want to understand Hindu temples not by their morphological description and all that, but what Stella brought in was the rituals involved in uh, temple practices. So that's one. The other thing is that the image right below Stella Cranbridge, which is the Nokshi Katha. So now we, uh, uh, Nokshi Katha, the, the, the quilted form of folk art, it became a folk art because of Stella Cranbridge. This particular uh, Nokshi Katha, as you can see from Maimon's Faridpur, was in Stella Cranbridge's collection. Uh, in her last years, she was the curator of Indian art at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and all her collection was there. 
she went around various villages in Bangladesh collecting, she got just interested in nokshikata and at that time it was not an art form, mm -hmm. it was just a regular household object mm -hmm. people used and made and did, women made and did and she just like loved the way people worked on those pieces collected them, displayed them and it became an art. So I don't know how many of you know this but because of Stella Cramrish. No, but the other important thing is that Stella Cramrish organized the first modernist exhibition of modernist art in Calcutta. She brought original work of Paul Clay, Kandinsky and other sort of, you know, Bauhaus related artists. So there was that traffic between Europe and uh, Calcutta. Then larger Bengal Bangladesh which is like mm. uh, and, my, and my last point is that not everything in the discourse is about buildings uh, as we move on with the stream uh, the exhibition itself is not a building the exhibition is an installation a construction but it's kind of part of a discourse and much of it is based on texts and I think again for our younger friends here we need to uh, we, we, we don't see typically you know see a situation like this, you know, that there's much work has been done by many people, perhaps mm. I was involved in many of them, but there are others uh, going back to all the way back to the Chetana newsletter when we started mm -hmm. to have a uh, kind of an intellectual conversation and on what is architecture, what, archi what is architecture in Bengal, what it should be, you know, and all that, to 1988 and various publications around the world uh, to 1997, this particular book, which was a catalog to a major exhibition that happened in the United States. First time Mazhar al-Islam's work was part of an exhibition at the time. And then this is the cover of the book that Saiful Haq and I did for the exhibition for Chetona in 2002. I, I show this because it doesn't say Bangladesh, but you know, I edited that issue of Edi but a big component was architecture from Bangladesh. Uh, and I think this is also political, and I'll say mm. this right now, that uh, in the 80s and the 90s, uh, yes, you know, uh, there was a different kind of perception about Bangladesh. There is a Eurocentricism about what kind of architecture from outside Europe should be entertained in the major publications mm -hmm. in Europe and North America. Mm. It was selective. Mm. An architecture review once in a while would show something, uh, which is a good thing, mm. but then it was very selective. And in the 80s and 90s, you know, well, whether it, whether it was because of the body of work or not, uh, to have a, a single devoted issue on Bangladesh, that wasn't happening. It's beginning to happen now, but then with your exhibition, I think it makes a big move in that direction. Mm. Maybe this is a point where we can yeah, come come to the uh, again to the contemporary uh, architecture. So far, we have spoken about the past, about um, until Chetana uh, and so on. But but still, I think we could talk about some of the um, contemporary work that we, we we have on display and and uh, also to explain a little bit what is our interest in the West um, to learn right. fr from these What's uh, buildings. Your interest, Nicholas? Well, okay, maybe some uh, examples again um, about porosity, about uh, this porosity in a social uh, social aspect. Um, a building you all may know, Friendship Center, for example. I mean, architecture is here, uh, serving some of the poorest people in the. <coughs> Uh, northern area and again it's um, architecture that gives answers with space, light, proportions and nothing else. So even in that field, in that segment, um, there is an awareness and I would also say there is an ethic of the architect's uh, profession of today in Bangladesh um, that architecture is not something for only a few of us. It's for the whole society. We could uh, go on with other examples like this, uh, also in Gaibanda, Chor village, uh, this um, Dinajpur I have already shown, then SOS village by Razul Hassan, which was mentioned before. Then we have um, Saiful Hawks uh, yeah. uh, House of Orient. Do you mind going back to Razul Hassan? Because I just want to make a point that, uh, you know, that. There's much to discuss, but I think uh, Razul Hassan passed away, um, and uh, you know, 
uh, it's only natural that many of the people of the younger generation mm. do not know enough no, of his yes. work. It has not been published. But Raziul Hassan, he was a strong sort of, you know, uh, leading member of Chetana. Okay. He was part of the exhibition, uh, organizing the exhibition mm -hmm. and all that. But his architecture was quite remarkable. Again, you know, at, uh, in one quick glance, you will think of, you know, kind of set of regular buildings. Mm -hmm. But I think they were radical for two reasons. Uh, first of all, he was not sort of afraid to be ordinary in the kind of Robert Venturi sense, if mm. I may say so, mm. uh, because it needs quite a bit of, uh, quite a bit of uh, strength mm -hmm. to give up your uh, training that, you know, your work needs to be spectacular, like look at me and all mm -hmm. that. This is not about look at me. This is about being in that place. The other thing that uh, Razi will introduce in this work relationship with the landscape, you know, and, and not in a very sort of massive way, but modulating the platform, you know, it's not just a building sitting on the ground, but steps, terraces, platforms, walkways going up and down. So I think another thing that architects in Bangladesh will have, you know, some of the architects in your exhibition and elsewhere are doing that, uh, you know, dealing with, working with the land, which again, Khan is a good example, mm. working with the land mm. slash water. Okay, sorry. Good. Anyway, um, we could go on for this uh, for a while, um, but you spoke about coming to the city. And here again, I think there is an interesting example of a, of a high-rise building mm -hmm. uh, that brings the pavilion into the city, again, mm -hmm. in a very uh, sophisticated way. It's a stag sta uh, staggering and, and mm -hmm. stacking of pavilions, which helps to um, bring that uh, effect of, of, of the, the bungal hut into the urban um, climate. So this building uh, works with very low tech, uh, it has cross ventilation and also it brings the rural um, uh, scale into, into uh, the urban scale. This is uh, something very remarkable. There are many uh, other projects going in that direction. We, we have picked some. You the name of the architect. Yes, this is Nahas uh, Khalil's um, uh, Akash Pradeep building in, in Banani. Um, he has done a lot of research on this uh, typologies. Uh, I think he's a master in, mm -hmm. in, in floor plans and cross ventilation, uh, all these things. So we have some examples. Also, Marina's Tabasum's building, uh, working with natural ventilation and so on. So we're not only talking about um, this kind of architecture, we are also talking about um, um, what you would say the tectonic um, type of architecture. And again, Rasiul Azan, then of course, Bashirul Haq. Um, we have different work of him, Kalindi Apartments. And Urban Culture, very important project, I think, is Cafe Mango. Not only as in terms of architecture, but only as, uh, also as a social um, uh, action in the city, uh, designed by um, Saladin Ahmed. And um, it's uh, somehow uh, a new type um, of uh, urban culture, which was implemented um, by this uh, cafe, ma cafe mango uh, branches. Um, another building, maybe that is interesting in terms of urban space, is um, this building, uh, Mohila Shamiti complex by uh, Ezan Khan, because here. Um, the boundary wall of the street is opened up and the public space flows into the plot. And the public space uh, is implemented into the architecture. So I think this is a, a good example of how architecture um, interacts with the public space, which is becoming a rare good here. Mm -hmm. And usually you have a street, you have a boundary wall, behind you have the paradise garden. But this building is, again, negotiation be between the private, the public. So therefore, this um, is a good example in, in that way what um, a new urban approach could be for Dhaka to de-densify the city. Not densifying, but de-densifying somehow the city by providing public space into um, the buildings. Okay, uh, there are many more okay. things to talk about, but okay. maybe s just some images um, of the exhibition. And so maybe that uh, the big fat, let's yes. see the big fat Yes, book. yes, um, I have some images, okay. I have uh, something here. 
the point was always how, could we br how can we bring the mood of Bangladesh to Basel? And this is a building of the 19th century, a Swiss architecture museum. And um, I think people should understand the context of, of, of Bangladesh to understand uh, its architecture. And this is the plan, basic layout. Uh, chapter one is about um, the history we have talked about before, and then all the rest is about contemporary architecture and uh, the future presented here by the works of uh, Bengal Institute. So this is the setting given by the building, 19th century uh, museum. And how can you bring things like this to Basel? Uh, this wonderful urban setting, informal setting, but providing um, an atmosphere, uh, creating a space, light, shadow, found in the street. And I started to do some collages, uh, you know, implementing, uh, blending these two worlds. Another example is uh, Masrul Islam. How can you bring this feeling into Basel, the Charlies of the library? So these ideas came up, textile, of course. Um, and this is how it looks like now. So we have the Charlies there. We have kind of this 50s, uh, 60s atmosphere with white modernism for the first section. This is the opening night. We have uh, some original documents. And then you come into the contemporary section, which is totally opposite. We're working with textiles, with um, um, plants, photographs, uh, texts printed on textiles. We have a lot of models here. And we are very grateful to all the architects that uh, have provided us all their original models. And um, it was logistically a challenge. Um, and I'm happy for this collaboration uh, in that sense as well, not only in terms of content, but that we had a partner here that helped us to bring all these marvelous objects um, to Basel, to collect these things here and ship them to Switzerland. Anyway, I think we have now a little bit of that Bengal mood um, in Basel, and this is how it looks like. The colors, of course, on the walls are inspired by the spices here. We have some films as well, and this is now the book. Um, how it, it looks like we have contributions by Kazi, by Saif, and Mansur Islam talking about um, culture in Bangladesh. And we have marvelous images by Ivan Ban, who came here during monsoon. Because our uh, opinion was if we bring out the book um, on Bangladesh, it should be about rain, because rain is or monsoon is an important element of architecture here. So this is maybe the first book, architecture book, about rain. Usually you have a book, blue sky, bright sun, um, flashy architectural images. And this book is more about um, yeah, the rainy season. You see a lot of rainy uh, images. Um, and that explains much more about the architecture um, or how it is okay. derived from the context here. Okay, and I think we're coming uh, to the end. Uh, the but you know, why don't you show us the book? The phone book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the back. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you know, it's a, it's a marvelous book, fantastic production. Uh, the book will be uh, available at Bengal Boy, the bookstore, the Bengal's bookstore, from the first week of March. Right? Yes. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, and it has to be mentioned that this is just the beginning. I mean, there will be many more it's exhibitions and well. books on Bangladesh, I'm sure. So, we did a selection somehow. Um, yeah. It's the beginning, and we hope that this will uh, motivate uh, other people to, to bring out more publications on, 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 on Bangladesh's architecture and also have a different, different opinion on it. I mean, this is maybe a, uh, our point of view with Western eyes, what we have um, published here. Uh, you may call it a subjective 
opinion, but I think there will be more um, opinions on the same su subject in the future. So this is the beginning, and I, I hope that Bengal stream will flow okay. again okay. and again and again. Okay. Bangladesh okay. architecture. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Kazi Khaidashraf, and uh, thanks to Nicholas Grabber for this wonderful conversation. And thanks, everybody, uh, for being here today. Thank you. <laughs>